just briefly, um, Dr. Johnston is really a, uh, a national leader in CLL research. Um, he's a senior investigator uh, um, at, the, uh, um, uh, at the University of Manitoba, uh, has been actively involved in uh, clinical research and basic and translational research, uh, and really a thought leader in our country. I can't overstate that. Um, he's, uh, uh, he's got a, an excellent um, uh, multidisciplinary collaboration that includes Dr. Gibson uh, and the ability to really do um, important work from both a, a basic science and translational standpoint. Um, he's also uh, uh, developed a very important national scientific meeting that brings researchers from all over the world together uh, to, uh, to, to discuss and review issues related to CLL that happens every fall. Uh, so it really is uh, our pleasure to have, uh, to have him here today uh, and to, and to uh, provide some insight into CLL and some of the treatment issues uh, uh, for Canadian uh, patients. James. Well, thanks very much, Graham, and it's, uh, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me. And I'm sorry you, met, you mentioned the jets, because that's a very sore point at the, at the moment in Winnipeg. We, we got swept away and quite quickly by the ducks. But um, I was asked to, to talk to you today about the evolution uh, of therapy for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And I'm going to do this uh, sort of really in a, I'm not going to talk purely about uh, chemotherapy. I'm going to talk about uh, managing also the complications uh, of this disease and how things have advanced in the last uh, really 60 years. So it's going to be partly historical p perspective and I'm going to try and give it a Canadian flavor since I'm going to be followed by the uh, um, Dr. Keating and Dr. Halleck representing the United States and, and Canada. And we have actually got a strong history of CLL research in Canada which some of you may not be aware of. So I'm going to, uh, if I can get my pointer to work, um, I'm going to talk about three things. And, and um, these are really looking at uh, attempts to reduce the risk of second cancers in CLL, um, reducing infections in CLL, and then talking about treatment of the disease. I think we can get very focused on looking at drugs to bring down your lymphocyte count or shrink your lymph nodes and forget that those treatments may actually make the infections and second cancers worse. If you look at the main causes of death in CLL, these are the three main causes. And just focusing on, on one aspect is incorrect. And I think uh, Dr. Keating is going to talk on this aspect too. This was actually the original, I'm showing this because this was the original description, a classic paper in 1966, which was by David Galton, who was, uh, worked at the Royal Marsden in London. And he published this, actually, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, which was, which was very nice. And this was really an update, a 15-year update, on patients he had followed in London as part of his PhD thesis. And even at that early time, there was very interesting reading, but he described two types of, of patients with CLL, those with aggressive disease and those with a more benign disease. And in fact, we now knows that, know that those are patients who've got either mutations or, or no mutations in the immunoglobulin gene. Um, but the other thing, he noticed in that paper was that these patients had low levels of gamma globulin. And the second point he made was that if these CLL cells are really cancer cells, what are they doing to the normal lymphocytes? And I think that this was, he was a very, very smart man, and this was very insightful. And if you, there we go. So if you look at the effects of CLL, I've shown here on the right, normal lymphocytes, and these are an in integral part of your immune system. There are B cells and T cells, and there are varieties, there are natural killer cells. Um, but the, T cell, the B cells produce these proteins called immunoglobulins, 
and the uh, T cell and the uh, these cells are responsible for fighting off bacterial infections, and their T lymphocytes are important for fighting off fungi and viruses and also cancer cells. Now, CLL cells, since uh, Galton made his description, uh, it's been shown that the CLL cells can paralyze your immune system partly by releasing chemicals that suppress the good cells, but also by just the physical interaction of CLL cells with the T cells, they can paralyze their function. And that uh, there's one drug, uh, lenalidomide, which can actually reverse that phenomenon. And that's very important. But most other drugs um, uh, actually suppress your B cells and T cells. So that actually taking chemotherapy may be good for your lymph nodes, but it's not going to necessarily improve your immune system. So if we go on and uh, talk about uh, cancer, there is the first major paper on second malignancies in CLL actually came from Winnipeg, a chap called Brian Weinemann, who then um, was head of the cancer clinic in Victoria. And what he showed was that the risk of cancer in CLL patients was about twofold or two to threefold higher than in people, patients who did not have CLL or people who did not have CLL. And skin cancers are the primary problem. And we've subsequently updated this. Uh, we have did a study in, in Winnipeg looking at a, a more updated group of patients and showed that this is uh, not just because we follow our patients closely, but if you compare it with other lymphomas, CLL patients are different. They have this increased risk. It doesn't matter what your age is, your, your risk in, is uh, is increased whether you're a younger patient or older, and um, it uh, increases further if you get chemotherapy. So it's, your increase is twofold, and then if you get chemotherapy as well, it's another twofold. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about skin cancer because this is so important. Um, the earliest uh, abnormalities that we look at when we, when we check our patients is for what's called actinic keratosis. These are these little areas which are caused by sun damage. Many of you, I'm sure many of you, 25% of our patients have skin cancers and far, far more have actinic keratosis. This is caused by sun. It is usually on the forehead or in your, on your nose or the tips of your ears. And if it is uh, not treated, it will progress to what's called squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. And the... Um, this early abnormality can be easily treated by using uh, liquid nitrogen, it's a spray, or we use what's called effudex as well. And the next phase, if you don't treat it, is squamous cell carcinoma. And here's uh, one of our patients with the tip of her ear, and this, uh, this needs to be either radiated, but usually we do surgery to remove it. And these need to be treated because they can grow quickly and they can spread. The more common cancer that you will see is basal cell. These are the most common, and these are usually remain localized. Typically, the most of the ones I see are, are over the nose, um, but, uh, and they are different. You can see that they have this kind of rolled edge to their appearance uh, as opposed to squamous cell. And then there's the, um, my slides won't work. There we are. Then there's, of course, melanoma, and these, uh, again, are more common in CLL and need to be picked up early. And the last is um, a particular kind of uh, uh, cancer, which is typically seen in CLL. It's not, this is the least common, but we would have, uh, we have about five or six patients with this, and this is called a Merkel cell tumor, and it's caused by a virus, and again, it can grow quickly. Now, I'm emphasizing this because skin cancers are so important. They are so important. We have a dermatologist in our clinic. All our patients see a dermatologist at, uh, in diagnosis or within a short while. And if they have any of these abnormalities, they are followed by her on a regular basis. So my advice to you is get checked by a dermatologist. Avoid the sun or use sunblock. Um, and then, of course, the other uh, cancers, which are more important, 
uh, are, uh, which are more important are in men, lung, colon, prostate, and in women, lung, colon, and breast. And you, we strongly emphasize um, screening for these cancers. Our patients have colonoscopies. We have a smoking cessation clinic, and we are, are quite um, vigilant when patients come to us to talk to them about screening and have they had their screening tests. So that's just uh, the first point I wanted to make. I want to talk now about infections. And um, my button up, pointed at the back. OK, so this is uh, from, um, from Winnipeg. We looked at all our patients at their initial immunoglobulin levels. The IgG level, which is a predictor of risk of bacterial infections, is reduced in 25% of patients at diagnosis. And with time, this immunoglobulin level will drop. And um, as it drops, then it increases the risk of infection. Uh, low uh, IgG levels are particularly associated with sinus infections and with pneumonias, but it can be really any type at all. But those are the, those are the important ones. Um, usually the level of IgG, it varies according to what you read. We use a cutoff of three or four grams. We follow the gamma globulins and our patients every year, and uh, you should be aware of yours too. We follow it every year. If it goes to below, usually if it goes down to three or four, um, then we look out for infections. And the, the tip-off for us is if you have uh, required intravenous antibiotics for infection, or if you had um, required antibiotics for more, or two, more than two or three times a year. It's not just getting a cold. You need to have a significant infection. So if that occurred, we would place you onto gamma globulin. And Erin tomorrow, who's, who's a research nurse in our clinic, is going to talk to you in greater detail about it, but, um, about our program. But um, the one of the problems with gamma globulin is that, that the, the literature and what you've read, I'm sure, is very uh, fragmented. There's no sort of good, firm guidelines. And it's partly because treatment has changed over time, and the effect of different chemotherapies can influence it. So many things can affect the ability to, get, uh, to have infections, the chemotherapy, the gamma globulins, whether you're in remission, et cetera, lots of factors. Um, now, you can give gamma globulin, so that's generally what we do, and about 5 or 7.5% of our patients are on gamma globulin um, at one time. Um, so the, we usually use subcutaneous gamma globulin, and because it's, uh, patients find it more convenient, they can uh, carry the gamma globulin with them if they go in Winnipeg. A lot of our patients go to warm places in the winter, so they can take their gamma globulin with them. And uh, it can be kept at room temperature, and they, we, Aaron teaches them how to uh, administer it to themselves, and they do that once a week. So that is, it works uh, quite well. And for our perspective in the cancer center, it's much cheaper, so it actually saves quite a bit of money. Um, and the reason, because of, of chair space, and we uh, actually use a lower amount of gamma globulin. The other things are the value of vaccines, and this is always a, a how beneficial they are. It's difficult to know, but we certainly recommend that you get your flu vaccine every year and to get a pneumococcal vaccine as well. Don't take the shingles vaccine. It's amazing how many of our patients that go to their family doctors and they try and persuade them to get a shingles vaccine. Even more bizarre is that if patients get shingles and then they go to their family doctor who gives them the shingles vaccine. They've already been vaccinated. They've just had shingles. But um, so avoid that. There is going to be a new vaccine, which is going to be um, not a live vaccine, so that'll be safer. Uh, and I think Erin's got lots more. This is one of the pictures she, sh uh, she uh, sent to me. Um, but I think she's got some to show us tomorrow, one of her husband being injected. So you're going to see his abdomen tomorrow. So um, the one thing that you do, the, probably the commonest side effect with the subcutaneous gamma globulin is the skin rash at the site of injection. But a lot of the other side effects that they get, like the flu, or, or you may experience flu-like symptoms, or muscle aching, or fevers, um, you don't get with the subcutaneous. 
So anyway, that's uh, I'm going to move on now. Oh, uh, one of the last point was the uh, lenalidomide, um, and uh, as Dr. Keating will probably talk to you about, uh, lenalidomide does is one of those drugs that does can improve the immunoglobulin levels and could improve T cell function as well. Now, Dr. John Bird um, is uh, the pioneer or the the champion of ibrutinib. And uh, he, uh, he feels that the immunoglobulin levels also improve with ibrutinib, but um, I think it's maybe too early to say for sure. So we're going to talk about treatments now, and I'm going to go back to Dr. Galton. And uh, the reason I'm showing this is because he, as well as uh, describing CLL in detail in the 1960s, he developed chlorambucil in the 1950s. And the reason that this has got a Canadian connection is because the second person on that list is Lionel Israels. And Lionel was, our, was my, my mentor, is why I work in CLL. And uh, he had a profound effect on many, uh, many uh, people across the country. He was the director of, uh, of Cancer Care uh, Manitoba for many, many years. And uh, he brought back, when he came back to Canada, being trained in London with David Galton, he brought back chlorambucil with him in his suitcase, and he treated patients in Winnipeg in the 1950s. And we still use chlorambucil today. And I thought this was really interesting, too, because when I was reading the article, we're, we are so used to talking about remissions in our patients. But that original study, when they looked, they talked about benefit. And they actually talked about really the effect of chemotherapy on quality of life. So they were talked about benefit, and it, what they said was, we mean improvement in the real value to the patient, so as a result of treatment can return to something approaching a normal life for at least six months. I thought that was really quite amazing. Never talked about lymphocyte counts or spleen size. They talked about, did it really improve your well-being? And then, and some effect was a lesser effect. So I th thought that was really quite remarkable. Um, and you can see in that original study, there were eight patients with CLL. So you didn't need 1,000 patients randomized to two different treatments, but eight was enough. So nowadays, we, use, uh, we have got much more, uh, much more precise definitions. And I should say that one of the problems with chlorambucil was because there were no clinical trials. I mean, all of those patients were given different doses of chlorambucil. And the problem we've had with chlorambucil is that until recently, we never knew the right dose of drug to use. Everybody gives, and even now, everybody gives chlorambucil in a different way. It comes to fludarabine, because of Dr. Keating's work, we all use it in the same way. But chlorambucil, everybody has their own favorite way of giving the drug. And this, um, so the, really this definitions of response have also changed how we develop drugs and ensure that, that we're using the right dose. And so basically here I've just shown a pattern. I can't point, unfortunately, but this is a typical patient who gets diagnosed, the disease progresses, and then is treated and remains in remission for a while, and then there's a relapse. And the things that you, uh, we measure now, really the three main points are the depth of remission, whether you get a complete or a partial or no response. Uh, then we have what's called a progression-free survival. That is the time to treatment until you relapse. And then there's the overall survival. So I'm mentioning these because I'm going to come back and mention them later, and you probably need to know these definitions for the coming talks as well. So progression-free survival is a good measure of how long you're going to stay in remission. And the other point that has become apparent as we've developed these drugs is the deeper the remission, usually the longer the remission occurs. Um, as Dr. Keating pointed out to me, that's not always true. If you have a deletion 11, you may have a very nice remission, but you have early relapse. So not all things are true. So I've also shown here what I thought went through the sort of the evolution of therapy. And um, there were a number of major points I'm going to make. One was the development of chlorambucil, and then Dr. Keating's work with fludarabine around 1990. And then uh, the next major 
development was with rituximab. It made a huge difference, and that, um, that was then combined with F uh, fludarabine and cyclo, as Dr. Keating did. And then um, later on, uh, there's a bit of a gap, but then around 2013-14, there are three major advances. One advance was with uh, Ben Namustin and Rituximab, and Dr. Halleck can talk to us about the development of that regimen and as it compares to FCR. The second was with the abinutuzumab, which is the new version of Rituximab, which I'll touch on. And then uh, finally, the newer drugs, Ibrutinib and Adalalacid. So I want to make one point here is that when I was a resident, and I've um, been treating CLL or focused in CLL for 30 years, when I was in training, people actually said that our treatments actually didn't do very much, that they, we, we were really treating ourselves. Um, and that was when we had chlorambosol. But this is from the Barcelona group, and they looked at survival of their patients before and after the development of fludarabine. And there was a distinct improvement in survival with the development of, with the addition of just one drug. And the benefit here was for patients who re required therapy. The patients who did not need chemotherapy had no difference in survival. It was patients who underwent treatment, which with strong evidence, I think, that fludarabine actually had an impact in survival. I want to mention now the rituximab and abinutuzumab, and what is the difference? Well. Rituximab is remarkable. It's an antibody, and it coats your leukemia cells like sugar coating. And this sugar coating uh, allows the body to recognize the cancer cells as being foreign, and those cells can then be cleared by your liver or your spleen or your bone marrow. Some cells will break down in the blood and cause those reactions that many of you have had. Um, but there's another, the third mechanism is this direct kill by the rituximab. It has a direct effect on the cells, and that's why you get this great additional benefit when you add rituximab to chemotherapy. Rituximab by itself doesn't do very much, but when you give it with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, you have FCR, which is dynamite. Now, the other antibody, which is the new one, which many of you are aware of, is abinutuzumab. Now, this differs from rituximab in that it has a much greater direct effect on the cancer cells. By itself, it has a great effect. It will kill cancer cells very effectively. And part of the problem is then you get these reactions in the treatment room. You get these infusion reactions. Because it's so potent, you get breakdown of cancer cells in the blood, and you get reactions much more than you do with rituximab. Um, so you have to give it differently. You give a small amount in the first day and a larger amount in the second. But I think abinutuzumab looks really uh, a very exciting new addition. The next kind of theoretical point I want to make, and this is that as we've developed all these new treatments, we have a balancing act to follow. And this takes, um, this takes a little bit, it's a bit like cooking. You have to know, you have a recipe, but you know, have to know how to put it all together to, to make the right cake. And I think you have to be very careful. When FCR came out, for example, everybody thought that Everybody should get FCR, but you can't do that. FCR is suitable for some patients and not for others. And this is because really of fitness. And I think this is the German group have made this tremendous uh, contribution, I think, to our, uh, to our understanding by defining fitness. And so who can, is fit enough to receive one type of treatment and not another? Um, in our clinic, only about a third of patients will be able to receive, um, will be able to receive uh, FCR. Now, the question is, how do you define fitness? I, I think this is, I don't know how many of you do yoga, but this is the peacock pose, which is, which is pretty tough. And I think it's amazing that her earrings are still on. I think they would... <laughs> They should have popped off by now. But I mean, she's, that really is remarkable. So most of us would accept that she's pretty fit. But there are other ways of defining fitness. And I think I'm going to go through them because I think they're important. When you're going to go on to whatever treatment, 
These things have to be looked at. Your kidneys, how well they work. What you called your SIRS, which is your, um, which is the number of illnesses you have. And most of our patients uh, have, have uh, some other problem, whether it's high blood pressure or high cholesterol, or they've got, they're on low sec for stomach problem. All of those things add up. And um, they are also, uh, so if you've got too many of those problems, you probably shouldn't get FCR. And the third point is your performance. If you're able, like this lady, to do the peacock, you've got a very good performance status, as opposed to somebody who comes in in a wheelchair. So those are the three parameters that are used, and probably you're all quite familiar with them, but I thought it was useful to emphasize. Now, I'm going to go through the standard treatments now, and I've split uh, into fit, unfit, and frail. And the frail, from our perspective in Winnipeg, are those patients who could not take or cannot take an antibody. They may have severe cardiac problems, um, or they're just very frail. And so we, if we feel that they would not s survive a trans uh, an infusion reaction in the treatment room. Now, those are few in number, but they are about 5% of our patients. And for those patients, we would use chlorambucil. For the fit patients, uh, about a third of our patients, we, uh, we use FCR. But BR is now, um, is now being compared in the German randomized study with FCR. And I'll come back to that. But on balance, FCR appears to be the better regimen. And it's uh, probably because it's got a combination of the fludarabine cyclophosphamide. The bendamustine is purely what's called an alkylating agent like chlorambucil. And, and it, you may require both fludarabine and cyclo. So you can see there that if you actually look at complete remission rate, it's higher for FCR than for BR, but the overall response rate is the same for both. Now for the unfit, I think um, probably the country en masse um, is going to start using chlorambucil or binutuzumab. Um, the, it, is, it appears to be the most effective regimen, and if you look at the response rates there, um, you can see that they're better than chlorambucil and rituximab, and they're better than for chlorambucil alone. Certainly, the addition of an antibody to chlorambucil makes them much better, but abinutuzumab seems to be the best. FR is the favorite uh, regimen in uh, British Columbia, and this is one of the frustrating things our American guess, probably don't appreciate this, but treatment for, for uh, all our cancers varies across the country. It is, it is highly dependent on where you live, and the availability of drugs is highly dependent on which province you're in. So um, that is an issue. We're actually in the process, or we are hoping to get national guidelines for CLL, which will help smooth out that problem. So if we go on now, so those are our common regimens. I'm going to summarize what I, what I feel is, is the sort of state of, of art. I think FCR appears to be better than BR probably uh, overall. Um, in younger patients, it's better tolerated if you're less than 65, and so it appears to be the preferred treatment. If you're over 65, it's probably equivalent. Um, so I think it is, it is a toss-up there of which to use. The German study now shows that BR patients who are over 65 receiving BR had less problems with marrow toxicity and less hospitalizations. So BR may be preferable. But I've, I'm just going to go back a slide. I forgot to show you the costs of these drugs. If we just give chlorambucil, it's, it's about $600 for a six-month course of treatment. You add in any of these antibodies, or FCR, they're all about $50,000 for a six-month course of treatment. If you want to use BR, it's double that. It's 100000 So it's a big difference. So go back now to the, uh, to the unfit patients. Chlorambucil alone, or, or unfit or, or frail, if you l use chlorambucil alone, I talked about progression-free survival before I defined it for you. So it's about a year with chlorambucil. If you add in the rituximab, it's about 16 months, and then if you use abinutuzumab, it is 27 months. 
So it has a, there's a significant advantage, I think, in adding the abinutuzumab. This is just to, uh, to show you graphically um, the benefit if you're less, if this is for FCR. I think if you're less than 65, I think it's a no-brainer. You should get FCR. I think if it's over 65, it's still, we're going to have to discuss, uh, discuss it, but it appear they probably are equivalent. And this is the uh, chlorambucil of binutuzumab, and I'm really just showing here. I've shown on the left slide the, just the duration of remissions, and you can see that chlorambucil is um, a poor cousin there. But the actual, whether any of these, uh, we, they are likely, the addition of the antibody is likely to prolong survival, but how much and uh, whether there's a difference with abinutuzumab over rituximab is still unclear. Um, so I'm going to just, I'm almost finished, which is amazing for me because I usually talk far too long. But I'm going to, um, in the last few slides, talk about the new drugs. And we've recently had notice of compliance for um, abrutinib and adalalisib. And the abrutinib we probably use mo most of because it came out first. As, uh, you can get it now on a compassionate basis, second-line therapy or first-line therapy if you have deletion 17. And these drugs are really quite uh, remarkable. Your cancer cells cannot survive in the blood by themselves. They have to go into lymph nodes, they have to go to spleen or bone marrow, where they come in contact with other cells and they're nourished, they are protected from chemotherapy, and they can divide and then come out into the blood and circulate again. And if you don't let them, go into the lymph node or spleen or bone marrow, they'll die. They cannot survive in, in the blood by themselves. And so these new drugs block the binding of leukemic cells in these sites. So they immediately become unlocked or unglued, and they fall off. And this falling off causes them to die. Most of them will die, actually, in the lymph nodes or spleen. And then some will actually fall out of the lymph nodes and spleen and marrow and come into the blood. So what you see in the first four to six weeks is this uh, blue line. I'm colorblind. I think it's blue. Um, the, uh, you'll get this increase in the lymphocyte count in four to six weeks. And then gradually over the next year, in 80% of patients, the lymphocyte count will come back down to normal. About 20% of patients, it'll stay up a bit. But that doesn't seem to matter. Those patients seem to do OK. The green line is the size of your lymph nodes and spleen, which shrink at the same time as your lymphocyte count goes up. And if you actually look at the long-term response, now you're, you're looking at sort of this is for patients who've had lots of prior treatment, OK? So they've, this has had prior treatment, and they are receiving its second line. So the patients who do, don't do so well, are those with, not everybody does great. So if you've got a deletion 17, which if you've had lots of chemotherapy, you may well have, then the chances of a relapse are at two years are about 50%. If you don't have any problems, then you can stay in remission for a prolonged period of time, and a deletion 11 is somewhere in between. So that's, the, uh, that's uh, with second line. And obviously, the less treatment you've had before, then the better you do. And that's, that's not surprising. But it's very expensive. And this is going to be over $100,000 a year for life. So it is going to be a major issue. So in the last few slides, I just want to show you how, sort of to summarize what, what we, uh, our treatments are. This is in, in, in Manitoba, our fit patients, what we are proposing is if, they, if you're fit, um, and about 30% of our patients will be in this group. If you're less than 65, we would give you FCR. If you're over 65, it's a toss-up between FCR, reduced FCR or BR, and Dr. Keating may give me some advice here. If you're less fit, um, we would use um, probably most of our patients will get chlorambucil, and obinutuzumab. If you can't give chlorambucil, maybe for skin rash, it would be one cause, or you can't tolerate it, then we would give you FR. We use a lot of FR right now, um, but um, our FR in the past, now we use chlorambucil, rituximab, but as soon as obinutuzumab is available, we want to switch. 
And for our frail patients, which makes up about 5% of our patients, we just give chlorambucil alone. So um, if you relapse, then that's always a question, what do you do? Well, it depends when you relapse. So if you relapse um, after two or three years, then we would probably give you the same drugs again. If you, um, if you relapse earlier, we will do FISH again to see if you have a deletion 17 or not. If you have a deletion 17, we would put you onto a brutinib. If you're less than 70, we would consider you for a marrow transplant, if you're fit. Um, if you've relapsed after FCR, BR, uh, within a short period of time, um, you're not going to respond again to any of those agents, and so we would give you a brutinib. And in the, in the group in the middle there, FR versus chlorambucil, if you relapsed, we would pr probably try the other arm. If you relapsed after chlorambucil, we'd give you FR. Or if you relapsed FR, FR we'd give you chlorambucil GA101. And the last slide I want you to make point is that um, it's not just the drugs you need. You need to have the right environment. This is a last slide. Is, um, it's from, I have five minutes, I'm okay. Um, this is, came from the Mayo Clinic, and I think it's a very important and insightful. It caused a bit of controversy, but what they did was that patients who attended the Mayo Clinic with CLL were either you go to the CLL clinic and you're seen by people who have a special interest in CLL, or else you go to the general hematology group who may or may not be particularly interested in CLL. And they looked, so it was 50-50, they looked at how their patients did over time. And if the patients went to a CLL-specific physician, they lived on average two years longer than those who did not. It was a big difference. And they had no good explanation as to why that was. So we've done the same thing in Manitoba. We looked at our patients, and we looked at, uh, in, in Manitoba, 50% of patients in this particular, age, this particular time attended our uh, clinic, our CLL clinic, which is a specialized clinic. It has, um, it, it's primarily research-oriented, but it's got all the people who are involved have got some research aspect, both nursing and physicians. And, um, the, the survival was much better in our clinic. And I don't really have a good explanation, but we did break it down by age groups. And the reason that the patients did better in our clinic was because we were able to eliminate the age factors. Our older patients who came to our clinic um, did well. They did much better than if they didn't come. And they were much more likely to receive chemotherapy. Now, it may be that um, Frail patients don't come to us. I'm not sure if that's the case. Or whether they uh, felt that because a patient was in their 70s or 80s that they wouldn't tolerate chemotherapy, and so they didn't have that option. But one of our focuses now in Manitoba is looking at all the patients in our province to, to ensure that everybody is getting adequate care. So my summary slide is, um, in terms of, of second malignancies, please watch your skin. Don't sunbathe. You don't, don't need to burn yourselves. Um, and um, make sure that you have your surveillance for second malignancies. Um, the, this can occur even early in the disease. Uh, clearly, it's going to be a problem that will get worse as your disease progresses and your immunity diminishes. It's still a factor at all stages. Um, the, the, watch your immunoglobulin levels. At some point, you may require replacement. Um, the choice of treatment um, will depend on your fitness, so make sure you understand why you're getting a particular treatment. And I think the new treatments are going to be very interesting, exciting. We're going to hear more about them, I'm sure, from Dr. Keating and Dr. Halleck. Um, but um, it is, it, it's a financial, it's going to be a tremendous financial burden. It's something we're going to have to sort of uh, think about uh, as a community of, 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 of how we're going to manage this. And I showed this slide because it was actually after the hematology meetings and I was walking down in California. And you're going through the woods and you could see, and this bit like our journey with CLL, that you can see light at the end of the tunnel. It's just around the corner, but we're almost there. So, 
I think that's I think that's where we are with CLL in 2015. And thank you very much. Oops. Uh, Thanks very much, uh, James. That was a f fantastic talk. And we are on schedule, so we do have time for one or two questions. And while the microphone is uh, being run around the room, I'll just remind everybody that um, actually the presentations are being videotaped, and you can get access to the talks and the slides either on the LLC website or on the CLL PEG website. Uh, and the second thing is if we don't get to your questions right now, um, of course, don't forget to write them down, and they might be uh, good for the uh, hematology panel at the end of the day. But we do have time for, I think, for a couple. Okay. I have a question about immunizations. Um, I've tried to take a few uh, vaccines, and I never produce any um, level of antibodies. So, what? Um, is it worth it to get the vaccines if we tend to not produce the antibodies? I th yeah, I think that's I think that's a terrific question. Actually, the um, we I think it's, uh, the trouble is that we can't predict who is going to produce antibodies and who doesn't. Um, so that's why we just tell everybody to be immunized. It's one of the things we're actually looking at in our patients to see if we can, what is the actual response to things like the flu vaccine. And the trouble was that the, the immunization this year with the flu was even in patients who were healthy was only like 40 percent. So it's, it's, it is a difficult thing to look at. Um, I think, uh, but, but it is an issue. There's nothing that we can do that can actually make you better. That's, but that is, uh, that is, that is the problem. Um, the one advantage would be with gamma globulin. If, you're, if the IgG levels are low, the gamma globulin will give you some protection. For, particularly, for example, with pneumo, the, the pneumonia, uh, with pneumococcal. Dr. Johnson, I'd like to uh, pursue the discussion about idolisib and the inability for uh, cancer cells that survive in the peripheral blood. I'm in month 29 of the clinical trial in idolisib, and my case and four other patients of Dr. Furman deny what you just said about it, because I have no lymph node growth and so my ALC yeah, is increasing. Just that part, focus the, uh, could you say your last sentence again? I'm saying that, that it is possible for lymph nodes, cancerous lymph nodes that survive in the peripheral blood if you're on idealism. The, uh, your question was, can they survive in the peripheral blood with adalelicid? Well, you, you made the statement that they do not. They, they, cells cannot survive. They cannot survive in isolation in the peripheral blood. They'll survive for a period of time. They don't die immediately, but they cannot survive indefinitely. And I'm they have to come back. They have to home back into the lymph nodes and to be kind of get their batteries recharged. And that is why when patients are on, uh, the problem with adalalisib is the, those initial studies that were on rituximab, which will help clear the cells. But if you look at with, with the brutinib, um, you'll see that those lymphocyte count drops very, very slowly over a year it's as the cells die. But I'm at month 29. My ALC is now 7.3. And I have no lymph node growth, no spleen growth, nothing. So I'm falling yeah, off the trial this month. Okay. And there are four other patients of Dr. Furman that had the same, same conditions. Yeah. When you say uh, you say stay out of the sun, is is uh, using a heavy uh, uh, sunscreen? Does that help, or do you, or is that just you should avoid sun? Period. The sunscreen will certainly help. I mean, you can't hide. You can't uh, hide under a rock during the summer. So the, we use heavy, um, we advise people to use sunscreen and to use big hats. There are certain areas that are, that, that are particularly common, the tips of the ears. So if you're going to wear a hat, 
either one aware of Panama hat, not just a sort of a cap, and also behind the ears. I mean, people forget to put on sunblock, but actually this is, a, this is right behind the ears uh, is, is, a, is a focal spot too. So remember to not just the face, but behind the ears and in your uh, back. You can, our dermatologist also gets our patients. You can get, um, for, for swimming, you can get sort of a, it, um, a cover that will block the sun. And so they, uh, if you want to go doing skiing or you know, a boating and so forth, that's what uh, she gets the patients to wear. Uh, 